I grew up in Maine and had a, a pretty lovely early childhood with a beautiful parents that father looked like James Dean. My mother looked like Cher. <laughs> okay. <laughs> and, um, and it was pretty magical. I mean, my father was a printer and uh, he used to bring home big rolls of paper and I'd stretch it over the table. And I at really early age, I'm talking like six, um, draw these complete table size, dining room table size drawings of underground cities. Wow. Oh. Not knowing what I was doing, um, but just having a ball doing it um, on these giant sheets of paper. And um, I learned uh, a lot about nature in that setting because we were, I'll call it financially challenged. Mm -hmm. And so whenever we wanted to celebrate or do something um, to have fun, we went out to nature. And that really had a big impact on me. And, you know, when we, when it was time for uh, somebody's birthday, we'd go have a picnic in nature or we'd go mm -hmm. to the beach or we'd go, you know, out in the field or ride a horse or something. And um, it's had a huge influence on my work today. Mm -hmm. But in high school, I just was not focused on that. Actually, wasn't focused on anything other than being a really great drummer. Okay. And so I won, um, eventually won all New England first drummer, first chair in the orchestra and the, and the, and the uh, symphony. Oh, I mean, wow. The, uh, the, yeah. And so um, that took me on a path, um, got free scholarship from music school and, um, and uh, did pretty well with that, but lost interest because I was playing out at clubs and that was a lot more fun <laughs> <laughs> touring around playing in clubs. And, um, and so uh, I, re as I recall though, um, in high school, as I was graduating, the guidance counselor did the exit interview with me and said, Rick, we have a little bit of a problem and some of it's good, but you have the highest IQ we've ever had in our school and you have the lowest grades. <laughs> <laughs> and so uh i um so then she went on and said well we have to tell you what you'd be good at as a as an adult huh. as a career and it was air traffic controlling and architecture <laughs> okay yeah i'm i'm very curious to to have asked the counselor what's the connection between those two well uh, my best friend said uh you know uh she couldn't get past the a's but <laughs> okay, um yeah. But, at, you know, in this career, I think the air traffic controlling has an, is part of it because, you know, we're always landing projects and people and consultants and hmm. contractors and all. But uh, I, I, I had that in the back of my mind as I was playing music until I was 28. Oh, wow. So you were like a professional percussionist or drummer for quite yeah. some time. And was it mostly... I. I played the trumpet throughout college, mostly classical. So I'm kind of interested to hear about this aspect of your story. Was it mostly classical for you or also? No, no, no. I started out, you know, when you're, when you're young and you're learning and all that, it's you play in the symphony and I did that. Mm -hmm. And, uh, then marching band oh, um, yeah, and all that stuff. And then, then I, I, I got into jazz pretty hard, like acid jazz. Um, <laughs> you know, I can play really fast and complicated polyrhythms and all that stuff. And, um, and then I just started doing Motown and, and, uh, <laughs> And it was pretty fun. It was a band in Virginia Beach I played. It was 13 guys. I was the only white guy. <laughs> That's cool. And the only guy under 30. Oh. Wow. <laughs> and so that was fun. Two years, set up my drums, vacuum up the sawdust every night, and that was it. It was, it's, it was a great experience. Wow. Um, and um, at the same time, I was a bike racer. Like a you know, could, bicycle. Okay. <clears throat> I could just go out and say, decide if I wanted to ride 50, 100, or 300 miles that day. <laughs> and uh, got really good at that. Um, but then around 27, I decided I really wanted to have a more, uh, a, a, just a stronger career that was more about me. And I didn't see myself aging very well as a, as a drummer in Motown bands. <laughs> and so, um, and so, you know, uh, I just uh, decided I was going to go to architecture school. So hmm. in Maine, in Portland, Maine, I, you know, I took a physics class and I got it. You know, it, it worked out fine. So it confirmed that I could do it. And I looked around the country. And uh, back then you had to call the schools hmm. and ask for a catalog and then they would mail it to you. <laughs> no, no internet or anything like that yet. Mm -hmm. 
And so I got them in small batches uh, every day for a couple months. And um, I was putting cherry wood in the wood stove at one time. And the one came from the University of Arizona and it had a saguaro and a sunset. And I had a good friend that lived here. And um, I said, I want to go there. So I applied and got in. And uh, so being a smart guy at 28, I, I called him and said, my friend, can I pay your gas bill? <laughs> he put his gas in bill in my name and I paid it for the six months it took to get ready to go there and all that stuff. And they gave me in-state tuition because of that. Oh, uh, well smart, done. very smart. <laughs> it's very, very Pass smart. Pass that along. It's, yeah. It's yeah. Really there we go. <laughs> um, yeah. You just show up with the bills. Here's my gas bill. I mean, is that enough information? And, uh, <laughs> And so the school was pretty amazing. We had a Dean, Ron Gorley, who was Gropius as one of his closest friends. And he was this elegant, tall guy in a Beatles black and white suit, <laughs> uh, skinny tie and, um, an amazing teacher. And I just said, I'm going to go there. I am just going to do it. And I packed up and moved to Tucson. Wow. Did you with all my stuff in my drums packed inside my drums and all you, you took your drums with you? Oh yeah, yeah. So you didn't quit the drums cold Turkey. Uh, no, um, but uh, just before COVID, I played. I was a jury uh, uh, leader for the Western Mountain Region um, AAA Awards, mm -hmm. and uh, they coaxed me up to, onto stage, and I played, and I played better than I did when I was professional. Wow. Really, and I hadn't played in front of people for thirty-three years. But so this entire it time, mind. the last thirty-three years, you've been playing at home at your house, like keeping it up. I, I assume. Not really. Huh. <laughs> no, I did. What? I just sat down and it, it just clicked. And uh, being more mature, I did. The tempo was exactly the same as when I started as the end of the songs. And, wow. And I didn't know the music. I I, I did Stevie Wonder uh, Superstition uh, from memory <laughs> from hearing it on the radio. <laughs> <laughs> Do you ever wonder if, if you had stuck with drumming as your primary, I guess, profession and it, where you would have gone? Well, I didn't have the drive for it, mm. you know, and um, it, if you go out now and you go to a bar and you see bands and, you know, there's usually four or five and you wait so long for people to change instruments and all that stuff. It's not, I don't like it. I used to play all night. Oh, very taxing. And you get a lot of money. I make made more doing that than I do as an architect. <laughs> <laughs> Somehow that doesn't surprise me because uh, <laughs> architecture is tough. <laughs> yeah. Um, so you go to architecture school. Yeah. It sounds like there wasn't a whole lot of uh, intense research and preparation. Like, did you know what you were getting into? And when you got into architecture school and you started the classes studio, was it a surprise? Was it different from what you expected? Yeah. The, well, the one surprise was that I was older than half the faculty. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> and, um, but, uh, uh, the dean was very clever in that he uh, helped them adapt to me rather than give me stuff that you'd normally give a 17 year old hmm. starting architecture school at 28 they let me kind of take my own path and um there was a belief then in teaching the student not the course mm -hmm. and um, and i i lucked out i mean it was a beautiful program and i still help them and um um you know i just I can't say enough good about it that's wonderful. So you go make it through architecture school. Um, was, I guess one question I ask often is prior to going to architecture school and during it, were you more interested in, let's say the kind of creative artistic side of creating things in architecture or is it the technical yeah. stuff? Okay. Yeah, no. And my portfolio for getting into architecture school was weaving. Wow. Oh. A friend of mine uh, uh, left town to go work at another at a university in Maine, and uh, he lent me his uh, like eight foot long loom, <laughs> and I just couldn't leave it alone. It's sitting over there haunting me, and I just <laughs> went and bought a bunch of stuff, and I I got pretty good at this stuff. And when I brought my portfolio in and showed them, and it was all weaving, <laughs> basically they were asking if they could buy some of the stuff. Really, <laughs> um, and so. You know, I didn't have any architecture to show um, mm -hmm. or any interest in it uh, on paper or anything. And um, 
the turning point was, you know, of course, coming from Maine and the only magazine I got there, there was, um, fine home building. Yep. And yep. the whole, that whole, uh, era was all postmodern houses and stuff. Mm-hmm. So when I got to school, I got, I would just kept going with postmodern thinking and all that until fourth year. And then the new Dean, um, uh, made a special semester with, uh, Will Bruder and, uh, Lawrence Halperin and mm. Ricardo Legaretta. And it just, that was the turning point. It just changed my life. So then I'd exploded and, uh, Will Bruder recruited me right out of school to work on the central library in Phoenix. Mm-hmm. And, um, if you look in his, um, I forget the name of the publisher. Um, it's a blue and white book on the, on the library. Uh, all the sketches in there are mine. Oh, really? Yeah. All the pencil hand sketches. I was Kirby Lockhart's, um, uh, TA for four and a half years. That's like not even in the program yet. Cause first year you just have to, you know, make your way to get chosen to be in the program huh. for second year. And, uh, that changed my life too, because I had learned how to do so much stuff and, um, got to know all the great, you know, uh, rendering people around the country. And, um, I'd have to go pick them up at the airport for the symposiums we were doing. It just started this kind of energy to, to reach further. I'm wondering, because you didn't have like an architecture portfolio. I mean, right. prior to getting to school, uh, you had your, your percussionist and drumming experience. You had the basket, you had the basket, you had the weaving. Yeah, um, it wasn't basket weaving. It yeah, was... it wasn't basket weaving. <laughs> you had weaving, and then you had just yourself. What was it that made the school think like this is a person that should be in, into our program? And what was it that made, I guess, the other te- the teachers at the school and other people be think like this person is worthwhile to have as a TA? This person is worthwhile to they're going to go off and do something in the future. If you had to guess, um, I, I'm just. I can guess that maybe I had the spark in my eye and, mm. and, uh, and then I've always been someone who worked really hard at things. Mm. And so when I produce, I produced a lot in school. Um, and I'm kind of a, um, all of the place, nonlinear thinker. Huh. I don't do step by step. I do a lot of dream work mm. and I started it then. And, uh, so it was frustrating for them because halfway through the semester, I still didn't have anything that I, <laughs> <laughs> but at the end it was fully cooked and great. Do you think that came from your music background? Like, is that how music work? It's not really a step-by-step thing. It's more something that you kind of like have to think about and cook over time. Yeah, I think so. And, um, even today, the music influences the, the work in that, um, you know, when you're a drummer or any other player in a, in a, in a, in a musical setting, you, um, are thinking somehow about atmosphere. Hmm. And so a groove on a song is atmosphere and, um, creating a feeling. And so that's how I've gone off to uh, really consider, um, that aspect of things. And, um, I work with the other people in my office of, um, 22 altogether with the lighting design and interiors, um, uh, uh, via narrative because people get tired of sitting around waiting for me to do the sketch. So I go down and I verbally sketch for them. Um, and then, uh, let them shine with, with that as the start. So what would be an example of a narrative? Well, this has been written and said before, but if you go to the convent studios right off a convent and I used to, I, I would say, well, this, this wasn't narrative to anyone else because I was the only employee of my okay. architect. But, you know, I said to myself, um, okay, you walk up to a, you know, a historic Adobe wall, you open the gate and it squeaks a little bit and you close it, makes a little clank. And I'm thinking about all these little things. Mm. And then I tend to plant trees at entrance entrances that, um, you have to negotiate. Hmm. So there's a big branch that comes over and you have to duck like that to get into the first courtyard. And so I'm thinking about the ground crunching under your feet on the pedals and the water fountain, the sound of that, 
and the shadows and shades and and um and i just kind of tell myself those kind of things and nowadays i tell it to the people that work in the office i mean it actually paints a very strong image at least in my mind uh and maybe because i know the project but but i think in general it would paint a strong image in someone's mind do you think that uh what's my question uh, so i think there are a fair amount of architects architecture students young designers who are very much drawn toward the sensorial aspects of architecture. And that's a big part of, of how they think about it and how, what they design towards. But do you think that having a music background is one thing that allows you to not just to have those moments happen, but have them happen in a significant way to create a composition, as opposed to it being just a, let's say, random selection, a random assortment of different moments scattered throughout a, a project. Does that make sense, kind of? Yeah, it kind of does. I mean, um, um, I don't know how to answer that one. I mean, I think um, you know, then somehow it does become a little bit more linear in that you're trying to... Um, I um, design and teach the in the studio uh, scenario-based design. Hmm. It's, kind of, it's not much different than the narrative level where, you know, I really want to know where you put your keys when you walk in the front door mm -hmm. and um then all the aspects of um where you hang your backpack where you put your coat and how you bring groceries in if you have kids where do you put the baby carriage and mm -hmm. and and all and it it's ultimately and then most of all it has to do with finding nature in every room possible hmm. and if you look at our tennis and 205 project you'll see a pretty direct attitude about that, where we have these three light wells in a five-story building in Polanco, Mexico, surrounded by other five-story buildings on three sides, and we did these light wells and planted them heavily with green. Mm -hmm. And uh, every room except the closets has a has a view, and we open the windows and the smell of the uh, of garden soil and greenness. <laughs> That's Marina's heaven. I, I know it. <laughs> She's plant obsessed <laughs> and nature obsessed. <laughs> sounds a yeah. like a wonderful feeling. <laughs> it would be pretty remarkable to open a closet and then have a bunch of greenery behind it. It probably mess with your no, clothes. Well, they, you know, people have you know clothes. They don't want the sun on. Of course, of course. <laughs> it, you know, it's a simple thing, but the smell of you know moist dirt or like fresh cut grass or yep. you know just like f smelling the season as the the flowers are blooming it's it's a small second maybe in the day but i, I found it very it just transports you for for just a few seconds and i, I think it's definitely underutilized in, in what we do well i think smell is the most vivid um memory provoking yeah uh, uh sense yeah yeah um you know when you smell that cut grass like you just said um you know i go right back to maine yeah in my mind and uh, or even like I smell someone baking cookies next door or something. <laughs> it's like I, I I can see my mother at the in the kitchen making cookies for us kids. So you finished school and you're working at a, at an office, and it seems like you're given a lot of responsibility. You're doing good work at the office. Why did you decide to branch off and do your own thing? Well, it's pretty hard to go to another office after working for Will Brewer for three years. <laughs> <laughs> okay. You know, and um, <clears throat> the um, um, the thrill of that was really great, but it was really hard work because New River, Arizona is three hours from Tucson. Oh. And I lived in Tucson when I did that. And we had a kid. <laughs> Wait, so how did that work? Well, Monday morning, I'd, I'd get up really early and drive and get to work. I was never late in three years at, at, for an 8 o'clock start time. Wow. And uh, stay overnight on Monday night, get to work early and stay until about 7 because the traffic in uh, South uh, Phoenix is really bad. So I wait for that to finish and then drive home. And then uh, that was uh, – I would do 60-hour weeks in four days. So I'd have Wednesdays off. But my wife would just hand me the kid. It's your turn now. <laughs> <laughs> but during that time, I built a family home for us. Uh -huh. If you can find it uh, somewhere, um, uh, it's called the Joy Millen Residence. And it was my first project. And it was published like crazy all over. Really? Arizona Home of the Year. And 
um, and I built it myself with a, a new a kid on my on a papoose on the first on the front, <laughs> then on the back, and I'm using a nail gun with a with a one year old on my back. You know, it's like <laughs> intense. <laughs> And, but I got it done. It was really, um, it's a really special family house. Um, uh, but then I'd go back Thursday morning be there by eight, work again till late and stay overnight and do the same thing Friday and then go back on Friday night and work on building the house on Saturday and Sunday. Okay. Wait, so why did you decide to... I did that for, uh, that was a year. Oh, the... okay. That's a long time. So you decided I... to do that house before you got the job or no 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 i did it while i was working for will okay that's a lot of different and, things happening at once i, yeah. I will I must say i had a lot of energy you know like <laughs> if, I can, if you can ride a bike 300 miles or 100 miles or whatever you can do it anything you want mm. but i um uh after that was finished and uh my son ethan was more or less one at that time uh two i mean almost two uh second son was on the way and um, I just said, I can't do this anymore. Mm -hmm. And actually, my my wife uh, said, I can't do that anymore. Gene, <laughs> um, and so um, I, uh, what do you do? And I just found a little spot down in the, in the barrio in Tucson and um, uh, started my thing. Wow. And I, it, you know, I, nobody knew who I was. And uh, my first project came from someone looking me up and looking up the phone book and seeing my last name was Joy <laughs> and seeing it's for the convent studios and seeing that my office was on the same street. And that's how he found me. And he came in and he saw all these magazines with my family house uh, uh, articles and stuff. And he thought I must have been more established or whatever. But I literally was answering the phone at, trying to make a woman's voice. Rick Joy, architects. <laughs> did you really do that? Yes, I did it. I did it. Oh my gosh. Good for you. That's amazing. Just, oh, just a moment. Let me see if he's in. <laughs> like, Hello, this is Rick. <laughs> <laughs> I am not shy about doing anything, really. And so, um, the uh, and that worked, and we started the content studio. That's <sighs> hilarious. I was actually wondering how many people or, or, or prospective clients are coming to you because of your last name? Because <laughs> I feel like it's such a great name, you know? Well, it's, I think that he was the only one that, that actually said it. Yeah. But I don't know. I mean, who knows? <laughs> um, it's, uh, to add to that, I'm born on Christmas. Oh, wow. Are you okay? <laughs> You're a special human being. I don't understand this uh, high IQ, low grades, drummer yeah, type yeah. architect. Oh, and yeah. then... I was born premature. They didn't know I was going to be born on Christmas and they were going to name me Noel. Oh, good. <laughs> been... They changed it to Rick. Noel no, Rick. Joy. That would have been a horrible joke. Born on Christmas. Yeah. Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> There's other jokes that I'm not going to say in this uh, <laughs> podcast. But... It's okay. No one's listening. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> Um, it's always interesting to hear how different people's offices start and, um, you know, you, you were we'll have to ask for and find images of, of the house that you mentioned, the house that you built. Um, yeah, we have. but, uh, I'm also curious, so like, what was it about that house that m caught the attention of all these magazines? Was it because you were using a material in a certain way? Like, what, was there anything in particular? No, it, it's, it, it exhibited what I've been talking about. It, you, there's a big uh, tree existing on site and most of the rooms focus right at that tree. Mm. And so when you're in the living room, you just have full green on this giant window that looks um, uh, north east. Hmm. Fully shaded and um, and then, uh, you know, the composition is pretty fun. Um, it's just really two simple shed roofs that overlap and make a little clear story and it's a lot of wood a lot of concrete a low window to a reflecting pool and and uh, it just turned out to be a great place to raise two little boys that's amazing did uh do you guys still live there no have you moved no my um my ex-wife still has it okay <laughs> oh someone that's has it so say about that <laughs> yeah no and uh, and uh, we all go over there all the time and and, and do stuff together and pretty nice ah, really, really nice. those two little boys are uh third 29 and 32 oh wow 
Wow. Not and, so ditto yeah. anymore. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. People say, do you have kids? I say, no, I have grown men. <laughs> <laughs> And uh, my understanding is that one of them, I don't know where, was studying, is studying to be an architect? Yeah, he's taking a little break. Um, they didn't do for him what the school did for me when I was there. Um, it, it, he's been, uh, he got pretty frustrated with being, you know, mixed in with all the really, really young people. Oh, yeah. Oh, right. You know, at first year in architecture school these days, you get, it's just a, it's like high school. Yeah. yeah. They manage every minute and... And, um, and he was, I said, I'm not paying for any school unless you do it by 28. Like I did. <laughs> and, uh, he did it <laughs> pretty cool. And he just really shined for a while, but then it just got so tedious and a lot of extra busy work and all that stuff. So he just wanted to take a break. Yeah. Interesting. I think architectural education, maybe in some ways has broad, broadly speaking, changed a lot, obviously, since when you were in school and part of it has to do with the influx of computer technologies and the amount of stuff that a person has to learn and it kind of consumes all of the time it's the technical side of computers well it's also the homogenizing of it mm -hmm. in that um there have been so many complaints and lawsuits about kids who thought that they should have got a better grade and all that stuff so they mm. they now do is you get a, a grade after you've done the site analysis what and then you get a grade after you've done some concept work uh, they, they make, they're trying to force it into a linear thing so they can grade it mm -hmm. evenly across the board. Right. And that doesn't work for brains. I would fail in architecture school today. Yeah. 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 It's uh, not to get on a tangent about education, but we had just recently put out a recording, an episode where we just talked about failure in architecture school because believe it or not, we get a lot of messages from many different people. And one group are architecture students who are new to architecture. And we get a ton of messages all the time, I think particularly because it's the fall-ish. And they're saying, yeah. like, I'm, I feel like I'm failing and I don't know what to do. And, right. and uh, well, anyway, so I, I would agree that, that getting a grade at every kind of step of the way, it doesn't give you the freedom to, you need to fail, uh, you I, know. <laughs> I get the same thing. I get lots of complaints because I do reviews all over. And mm -hmm. um, the, uh, the, you know, people come up to me and they say, I, I'm like, man, your project was really great. Um, and they say, yeah, but I'm probably only going to get a C because I didn't do well on the site analysis. That's yeah. when the project was phenomenal. Yeah. And I had the benefit of that working for me where I could, I could do that. Yeah. 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 I mean, it, it, this also maybe ties into what you're saying about your own process or or your your way of working through a project which is a whole diversity of ideas and a lot of what yep. ifs and not saying that there are these one two three four five six seven eight steps and i need to be perfect at all of those steps that seems the antithesis of being free and allowing yourself to do a side plan and saying oh that side plan sucked let me go back and <laughs> redo it you know after i go yeah. for the back yeah and so um well you know it's um uh, we don't do anything like that in the office mm -hmm. um I give the site analysis to the youngest person hmm. to study and study the site and learn all about the wind loads and, you know, view corridors and all that sort of stuff. And then I tell them that they're in charge of walking around the room to the other people working on the project after they've done that and make sure they adhere to that site analysis. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. It's a teaching studio. I mean, mm. sometimes I'll go up to somebody's desk and I'll say, will you turn off your monitor? your monitors and uh, <laughs> don't look at your watch or your phone. What time is it? <laughs> oh, that's brutal. <laughs> it, it's, it's good because in the Rubio studio that we have, um, the main uh, cabin, we call it, uh, you can tell what time it is all day if you're switched on. And, and I want people to be architects, hmm. not technicians, not, you know, Revit people. Uh, tell me what time it is. Hmm. And then, um, I, the the rule is you have to have a sketch pad in front of you, draw to scale freehand hmm. with a pencil or a pen, then the keyboard, then the monitors. Really? No designing with AutoCAD or Revit at all. Interesting. You can just go so much faster. Do you find that with <clears throat> younger employees, whatever younger means, that they are... <laughs> They're all young. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that they are... Um, 
less willing or maybe less skilled in the sketching department than I don't know, 15 years ago, 20 years ago. Yeah. Well, for me, it's 30 years ago. Um, and so what's more troubling and what I'm trying to make sure people get a handle on is trying to scale, mm. you know, because AutoCAD and Revit, you don't draw a scale, right? You just, you don't know a scale while you're doing that. And so I can still sit and do a pencil sketch with, and draw to eighth or quarter scale <laughs> without a scale. Right, right. That that is impressive. <laughs> that is impressive. But you bring it's, up an it, interesting. It wasn't for me. That's what everybody did. It's an interesting point you bring, though, that when you're drawing in the computer, everything is, of course, at a precise dimension, which has its negatives, I, I think. But at the same time, it's totally scaleless, and it's, it's without an understanding of it scales in the sense that physically in real life the line of the computer is not equal to an eighth inch or quarter inch a lot of times but also scaleless in the sense that there's like a lack of understanding of scale and dimension i feel like yeah 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 no and it's fun uh interesting i should say actually that um you know when i say will you print that out at eighth scale it takes them a while to figure out how to do that <laughs> Because I want to slip it under some trace and draw over it. Yeah. So talking um, about your own process in the studio, so do you still obviously do a lot of hand sketching, working by trace? Is there any the using of a parallel, parallel bar or anything like that? Well, um, I just built a new studio for myself, a private one. Mm. And it's it's really gorgeous. It's uh, We have seven buildings that we have people in them and... Uh, and we bought a new building on convent across from our convent studios where we have lighting design and interior design with my wife, Claudia. Mm -hmm. And then I built a studio for myself that has a big drawing table. Uh, I've got five signed mother wells and a uh, Nakashima chair. And it's all my favorite things that I've had pictures on the wall. I call it the splatter wall. There's like tons of pictures and um, drawings that people have given me. And I have a, a number 23 of 24 prints of the Louvre at night by Steve Olds. He gave it to Whoa. me personally. Yeah, it's <laughs> pretty crazy in there. Um, so it's my little haven and I can go in there and draw on a big drawing table with a May line and which you can't even buy anymore. I wanted to buy a new one and you can't get them. So I went and found one in one of the closets at the offices. <laughs> and uh, it's better because it's old and it's, it works perfectly and well, at some point they they switched to plastic bearings, and um, I never didn't work as well as some. Yeah, ones. this one's this one's uh, stainless steel bearings. Oh, there we nice. go. That's like one of the original ones. <laughs> but you know, the young guys walk in and they say, "Man, this feels like an antique shop." <laughs> <laughs> it's like a museum gallery. <laughs> you know, there's triangles and scales and <laughs> and uh, compasses and stuff on you know in a box next to the table, and it's interesting. Do you think it's it's difficult to have your own way of working and have that be kind of taught to your, your your staff and your faculty your employees and how much of it can be um you know passed down to them in a sense because i'm sure none of them are using a main line or going to use a compass you know no no and um, i'm 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 not trying to pass that down but i expect when i hire somebody i just hire somebody in the first month you have to go get the old drawings that I drew by hand myself, um, uh, you know, and they're only for a house like Catalina house, uh, 20 sheets, <laughs> you know, and everything is on there. Yeah. And we're doing projects now with, you know, the Bay house was a hundred sheets of drawings, mm -hmm. That's not necessary. Mm. So I'm trying to reinvent the way we are doing our drawings and, uh, you know, I think we can do a lot fewer sheets in the fact that I think I want to do a concept detail, a couple of pages. And because we always do this, if there's two dissimilar materials, there's a small gap between them. Mm -hmm. I don't, we don't do moldings and all that stuff. Mm -hmm. And also we don't uh, allow any visible grills from, for the air conditioning. So there's always a slot and there's always return behind a cabinet or something like that. And to do those concept details that that's how that's going to go. So the contract can bid it. Right. And then, um, I don't know, I'm going to try that. Interesting. We're doing it on the house up in Minnesota right now. Uh, the concept details are for basically preliminary pricing. No, they're for building it. Oh, 
why draw every detail just to show that gap when it, they're the same everywhere throughout the house? I see. I see. Yeah. So it's like conveying to the contractor or the builder the idea or the principle, and maybe if the gap distance is the same, I don't know, then right. just apply that thinking to everything else. Yeah, I just want to, I don't want a big heavy set of drawings that people can't even carry to just build a house, you know? <clears throat> Hmm. So um, the early the early sets you could actually rip out the foundation plan and throw it away. I tried to get uh, reproductions here in Tucson to do perforated sets for me, so you could just rip them out. If I were really I, confused as to why you'd want that, <laughs> yeah, I mean, why go back and look at that? Yeah, interesting. Did did the house that you did for for your family did did you do any drawings for that? You just went like. Oh yeah, no, it's all gone. You did, wow. No, you really have to. You have to yeah. do the drawings. You have to follow along. And uh, people think because I did design builds on the first eleven projects that I just didn't draw that much. But everything is drawn. Mm. First of all, you have to get a permit. Mm. And second of all, I'm a a little bit of a, a, a scatterbrain, so I need to go back and look at what I was thinking. <laughs> Sure. I mean, there's a lot of things to remember on, a, you know, even small house. So. Yeah, yeah. It, it, and, you know, talking about design build, I think it's one of the maybe misconceptions or wrong assumptions that the average person has about design build is that they, they think because it's design build that they're that everything's going to be more efficient, which a lot of times it is, but more efficient because you're just going to ax out like 90 percent of the drawings. And that's not necessary. No. I, I've never done that. Um, I stick to the drawings mm -hmm. and uh, make everybody else stick to the drawings. Mm -hmm. And um, you have to get it on paper. You got to get a permit. You got to get some numbers from the subs and and uh, then um, a record of what you were thinking at the time. Mm -hmm. And I never have really designed anything in the field. Mm. Um, mm. Really, I can't even think of one time. Maybe on my family house where I changed a, a material on a wall because it suddenly got too expensive, so I, I rebooted and came up with something else, but that's about it. So you didn't issue a change order for that? <laughs> to yourself. <laughs> <laughs> Man, my bank hated that. <laughs> so going back, so you launch your office, you have this person who calls. When you decided to quit your job and, and start your own practice to avoid that you know awful commute, <laughs> did you, were you scared it, it would work out or not work out? Or were you kind of like confident that you were going to make it work? Both. You know, I, I, you know, I had confidence in myself, but I didn't know the market or how you get work or any of that stuff. Yeah. Mm. And, um, you know, uh, before that convent studio, uh, project came in, I, I went to some of my professors who built buildings and I said, Hey, I'll do the CDs for you. So I did that in the office for them oh. and, uh, kept the office open so I could answer the phone like a female. And, <laughs> and uh, and then I did a handful of small remodels mm -hmm. for really lovely people that are still living in them. And that's great. Uh, one of them was a remodel in addition that their young daughter went to architecture school and now she's working in a firm. And she, she came to me and she said, it's all because of you and that house that I grew up in. <laughs> oh my goodness. It's like, oh. <laughs> <laughs> um, I did want to also ask about the drawings. Uh, you had mentioned the difference between 20 pages and 100. Is, it, is the reason why sets in, in general, I think, have grown and blown up to that size is a lot of it is maybe superfluous uh, because of like this specific example of the detail you mentioned? Or are there other things too where it's just not necessary? I mean, do you feel it's necessary to have the amount of information that are, is now required to have in, in construction drawings? Yeah, I think there's a lot of half empty pages in the sets now. But oh. uh, you know, when I was doing it, the the engineers, mechanical engineers, would would let uh, they would do a design and then let me integrate their details into the architecture set. Mm -hmm. So a uh, detail for a structural condition had the architecture around it so it was one detail mm -hmm. but those guys don't let you do that anymore there's a you know the s drawings are a big part of it and they're separate and i it doesn't make any sense to me but it, you know liability is something we all kind of yeah try to keep in check yeah yeah these days so 
they have to do their own drawings, stamp their drawings without any of our information on them. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And that's why the prices go up. And, and uh, But if you can look, um, uh, there's some books that were out in the early 2000s called The New American House. Mm -hmm. um, and we have two projects in two of them where all the CDs are in there. Wow. Well, at, least, at, at least the details. Yeah. Yeah. And you can see, and there's one funny one where on the note that I wrote on there, if you have any questions, call Rick Sell. And I put my cell <laughs> number on it. No way. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Did people actually call? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> oh, do you get phone awesome. calls from people who have the book and they're like, yeah, hey, I saw your phone number? Yeah. You do, really? Yeah. Well, I don't have that phone number. <laughs> that was a flip phone that just came out. So. That's really funny. That's great. Um, so then tracking the story. So you start the office, you you have the, the first few projects. Were things fairly smooth sailing after that? Were you getting more and more work, um, you know, after the, the first few? Yeah, no, it, it, it started to become pretty steady. Huh. Um, people started to notice us. Um, and interestingly, I had a, a, a couple of clients back to back come in that um, uh, were uh, getting architecture record when we were getting record houses all the time. Mm. And they just noticed it. And, you know, then the two back house came and then the Tucson mountain houses came in. Those are nomad and Tucson mountain house. And then it, we were de designed build on all that stuff. Mm. And things changed at some point after we finished the Adobe Canyon house, I got a call or no, I got a, fax on the old fax machines where there's a like a roll like and it's like the <laughs> mimeograph paper like the receipts you get and yeah, you leave yeah, it on yeah. your car seat and you can't see it in two days <laughs> um from eleanor coppola and everything kind of changed at that point when, and i did a house for francis and eleanor coppola in napa oh wow that's <laughs> yeah. a pretty big deal wow yeah it's a pretty big deal <laughs> And, um, and I'd never been on private jets before and all that stuff. And they, they were picking me up and, and, uh, did you ever think it would be a scam when you found out their name? <laughs> like they're not real before people. Scams were like, a okay. Thing, right? <laughs> okay. no, it was real. And then, you know, two days later they stopped in Tucson and in a purple G four and, <laughs> um, and I picked them up at the airport and that, wow. uh, from that. And, uh, they came to the office and I took them around. And it was pretty fun, uh, of course, to be around Francis Coppola yeah. and Eleanor, especially. Um, but, uh, you know, I took him to Desert Nomad House, mm -hmm. the three little rusty cubes out in the desert. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And he goes, why would anybody want to live in their coffin? <laughs> 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 Taking a beating from this guy. And then we went back to the office and sat at the conference table, which was at the end of the main room. And somebody was playing music. And they put on that Groove Armada song, Shaking That Ass. <laughs> and I, and I see him going. Okay. <laughs> and the stories are just great. And I got out of it without a horse head in my bed. And it's a, a, a great, <laughs> one of my favorite things. I just stopped in and uh, we made all these ledges for them to put their artwork. Mm -hmm. uh -huh. I just have a pet peeve about seeing a painting and the, the hook and it's yeah. leaning out. You can see all that stuff. So I did these ledges so they could just lean them up. I did the same thing in Woodstock, Vermont, that big ledge. Mm. And I walked in and I looked around and they didn't have any artwork on. <laughs> that one sketch that, that Francis did of the house. Huh. It was brilliant. It's beautiful. And I said, well, you didn't put any artwork up here. And they go, we, didn't, we don't need it. You gave us nature. That's the artwork. <laughs> I'm like, oh, man. <laughs> oh, Francis. <laughs> And so it's just, uh, it was a great experience. And then things changed a little bit, not necessarily from that, but people started pulling me into more luxury oriented projects. Mm -hmm. And it was because, I mean, I asked a few times, why did you hire us? Mm. And um, they said, because we know you're going to bring nature into our lives. Interesting. Yeah. And so, you know, nature is free, right? Yeah. With the window in the right place. That's not free. <laughs> <laughs> uh, that's a good point. Uh, we're doing a house in Austin right now that's um, in uh, uh, Heritage Live Oaks, all ancient ones with the big branches that swoop down and almost oh, touch the wow. ground and everything. 
and we're doing this kind of star of the house that just captures one of those trees for every room. And it's, it's going to be good. It's going to be a good one. <laughs> oh, I'm excited to see it. I'm very excited to see it. Yeah, um, me too. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, what phase are you guys in for that project? Uh, schematic design. Gotcha. Okay. Oh, yeah. Um, you said, so after the uh, Francis house, things sort of changes, changed and you got more luxury residences. There's the luxury meaning that there's budget to do things and budget to cover the architect's fee proportionally. No, that's never the case. I mean, uh, you know, when people say there's no budget, I'm like, no, you got to tell me about it. Yeah. Mm. Cause that's, that's not true usually. Yeah. Uh, and so you know it you know that snowballs into doing amangiri yeah which is yeah. uh it's all about nature and being up close and privileged to be up close to those mesas and the rocks and the environment and the milky way which you know people come from around the world have never seen the milky way before mm -hmm. and so that place is is built and designed and built uh to be about that experience mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and so that once people catch on um, that that's how I work. They just started calling like crazy. It's been, been a blast. And, and in fact, uh, you got to check out the newest project uh, that's been finished. It's the uh, one and only Mandarina in Mexico. Oh, I've seen pictures of this. <laughs> it's that, in a jungle. That bedroom ceiling. I mean, I would never get out of bed if I was staying in that room. <laughs> Incredible. Oh, the one with the skylight? Yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's two different suites. One is a treehouse. It's 10 meters above the ground. Wow. And then and there's the, the grounded ones, which have that skylight. And so it's all about the canopy of the trees. You either get a room where you're in the canopy or you're in that room you're talking about where you look up to the canopy. Wow, that's incredible. So when you and, do those, uh, those projects, do you, like, what is your, how do you discover the site? Like, do you go there and you camp for three days, you sleep under the stars and you kind of feel the soil and then the wind or how do you approach understanding what nature has to offer there? I spend a lot of time on the site and uh, now I bring the people that are working on the project. So it's a team effort, but mm -hmm. you know, that site in particular, um, there are ticks and all that. I'm not going to sleep. <laughs> <laughs> um, but you know, I'm faster now. I, I'm turning 64 uh, soon. Christmas. Oh yeah. And um <laughs> uh you know, I just don't need that much time. Mm -hmm. But that project was 178 standalone buildings. Wow. It's massive. And we did um all the master planning. We designed and detailed the roads. The gutter work on the side of the roads is is like magic. It's art. <laughs> and um and uh, we did all the interiors. We even did all the collateral, like the soap dishes and all that stuff. Wow. Huh and uh, all the lighting. Wow. And uh, it was pretty fun. I mean, I've never dreamt of doing a restaurant for Enrique Oliveira, but we did. And uh, three or four restaurants, um, kids clubs and uh, uh, horse stables and polo grounds and all that stuff. And it's pretty loaded <laughs> and a whole bunch of villas for sale. That are on the site, part of the one and only, and so um, we we finished the project and we all shrugged our shoulders like, <laughs> oh god! And it's, what? Been, what? It, it's currently the number one luxury hotel property in the world. How long did so, it take to to design and get built? That one was eight years. Wow, uh, that's a long time. <clears throat> well, Amagiri was twelve. Oh boy! Oh really? Yeah, and so you, yeah, from the first day I walked the site, and then the the next time that I invited Marwan and Wendell to be partners, um, the uh, that one took twelve, and um, you know you consider then nine years of college, art school and music school and architecture, yeah, yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. twelve and eight, and I'm only sixty four. Mm -hmm. That's a lot, of, a lot of my life. It's half my life. You yeah, do yeah. on schooling and two projects. <laughs> <laughs> that's actually a pretty good um and the phenomenal projects and a great career but it's a pretty good kind of perspective to have for people who um, are interested in doing architecture like some of these projects takes a really long time yeah. and if you're doing large-scale work it's very common for stuff to take a decade it's like crazy yeah, <laughs> yeah no i mean uh the uh the mandarino one and only uh, we had 
uh, as many as 32 people on it in house, you know, to get all that done. Uh, you know, we have to go, you know, someone has to fly and watch some polo matches and go see the stables they have in Denver and other places around the world, Santa Barbara. It, all that stuff takes a lot of time to get it right. And we have a pretty good track record of um, doing really well on projects that we've never done the building type before. <laughs> and so we'd never done a hotel. And I'm on Geary, was Condé Nast number one for like eight years in a row. Yeah. And um, the same, at, like um, one and only, but uh, the most vivid one is the Princeton project that we did. We had never done a public building. Mm. We'd never done anything transit oriented at all. And, or, and we'd never, never done a gateway to a major university like Princeton and a township of Princeton before. And I think we got it. You know, it's a, that's a great story in itself in that, uh, the main uh, transit hall, um, and I changed the name of it to Transit Hall because the when we first started, there was a square on the master plan that someone else did. And in the corner was a little square for the waiting room for the train. And I went to the interview and I said, guys, we can't do this. And the president's sitting next to me and, and uh, the whole table full of people in the interview. And I said, we can't do this. I want to, if I get this job, I want to change the name of it to Transit Hall. <laughs> and I want to pull it away and do a transit plaza. And, um, and then uh, have a, an arrangement where we can have, you know, um, uh, the, um, what do you call it when you sell food on a Sunday? Um, like a farmer's market? Like farmer's a, market on yeah, one yeah. side. And then, uh, you know, either an event space or just a lovely place to sit under trees while you're waiting for the train instead of a little room. Yeah. And um, we're not going to put the bathroom in the transit hall. It's going to be over in the Wawa store. <laughs> I don't want to sit next to a bathroom hearing it flush while I'm waiting for a train while I am going to Princeton. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so we visited a lot of them. They all had that. And so we kind of got it together. And across the street from this place, this gateway, um, is um, a country club. And people, a lot of people get married at this country club. But over the years since it's been finished, um, I don't know how many now, but we counted up to 22 <laughs> couples who are getting married at the country club do a processional over and say their vows in our transit hall. Uh, are most of them architects? Yeah. <laughs> yeah, future no, employees. It's very, cha very chapel like. That's yeah. Really and, cool. um, yeah. and uh, a lot of the things I do are just come from my head and I just take a chance and, and uh, Mira Nakashima who took over for uh, her father when he died, uh, Nakashima, George Nakashima, is only 10 miles away from the Princeton project. So I went over one day to visit her and smell the wood and all that stuff. And I just took a chance. I said, you wouldn't want to help us in design and make the benches, would you? And she goes, well, what's the budget? And I was with somebody from the office who knew the budget, the line item. And um, she goes, yeah, I'll do that. Huh. So those benches at Princeton in the transit hall at all Nakashima. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> That's really, really, really cool. It's pretty cool. And then I got a really nice chair for my new little studio. <laughs> and she's really lovely. And she's going to go over and refinish the round one that's in the front because kids have been skateboarding on it and stuff. It's mm. like, they don't skateboarding know. on a Nakashima. <laughs> I have a picture of someone sitting on the floor in the transit hall with a meatball sandwich spread out on a Nakashima bench. Oh, gosh. <laughs> I, I don't know what that means. Well, I, do. I don't either. <laughs> it's very strange. There's cigarette butts all over the place and stains where they put the cigarettes out on the side of the building. And stuff. It's crazy. Yeah. yeah but they, you have to go with that mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. on a public building. So, um, I wanted to ask about the sort of transition, for, I guess, from design build to, I presume, away from it. Um, how did the design build... Uh, as an operation to work for you in the initial years, uh, was did you have an in-house construction company, a separate construction company that you used repeatedly, or how did that work? And then why did it stop being the primary model? Well, I I developed my own hybrid kind of way of doing it mm -hmm. uh, because uh, you know I put the first project, uh, uh, Convent Studios, out to bid, um, mm -hmm. and it was the numbers are crazy, and I said, Dan, I'm just going to build this thing myself. <laughs> And uh, I did it, 
But what I did, it was set up a diagram where the, it's an owner builder. Yeah. So the owner actually takes the permit. Mm -hmm. And then I do all the work like I'm a contractor, but it saves the owner all the licenses and all the insurances and all the liability and all that kind of stuff. And I just, um, they use homeowner's insurance mm -hmm. and it saves tons and tons of money. And uh, my, my team was uh, all recent architecture school graduates. Okay. And I had one um, Swiss uh, master carpenter who uh, led them. Ah. From France. France. And um, at, there, at one point I had 17 got people, men and women that just graduated as the construction crew. And I taught them everything. I had all the tools myself to do all that stuff, most of them. And um, for example, Chelsea, who worked in my office right out of school, we got kind of slow. And the great thing was that the design builds kind of kept the cash flow and the and the energy and the and the everyone busy. Mm -hmm. And uh, so that big door on the Catalina house uh, was built by Chelsea, and she'd never worked with wood before. And it's perfect. It's still perfect. 20 something years later, there's still a millimeter gap between the door and the wall. It's impressive. It's better than <laughs> what most subs can do for sure. Um, yeah. It's kind of interesting because you'd normally expect if there is a design build company that the build side of it would be, you'd be using people who were not just <laughs> fresh grads from architecture school, but they would be, I don't know, seasoned fabricators and subs and things like that. Yeah, no, I found it's kind of the same uh, as the as the point I was making about uh, doing really great work if you've never done the building type before. Because hmm. you don't have it in your head that it's got to be a certain way, like mm -hmm. repeating. And there are lots of architects who just have their signature style and keep going. And you'll notice that we don't have that. Every hmm. project is different. And that just keeps it more fun. And, and I can't do it again. I promise people that I'll do a bespoke project for them and I'm not going to repeat it. Hmm. But, um, you know, when you have somebody right out of school and you believe in them uh, and they've never done the carpentry or whatever before, it's um, uh, they can do a better job because they're going to be more focused and they want to learn and mm -hmm. they'll take a little more time and stuff. And I I'm a, I feel like I'm a pretty good teacher with that stuff. That's great. You know, there's always funny things that happen. Like I, I walk on the Catalina house and it's all those big panels of wood or cherry plywood. And I walk in and I'm looking at this guy and he's, He's supposed to palm sand the 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 big sheet of uh, cherry plywood, mm -hmm. and um, and it's starting to like make black marks and stuff. And I said, "Hey, show me your sand." And he had he was sanding it with no sandpaper, just the rubber. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, get out of here! <laughs> and I, I, I I saw him uh, just before COVID someplace at one of the schools, and I said. Man, I'm never going to forget. It. He said, don't tell anybody. <laughs> <laughs> well, as I yeah, said, I <laughs> no one's listening, so he's okay. There's <laughs> always funny stuff like that. It's <laughs> hilarious. Do you think it's important for um, you know architects to have that kind of immediate, uh, uh, direct, tactile understanding of certain things like that? even if they don't necessarily end up using that material in all of their projects? Like, do you think there's some, some kind of connection between the making of the thing itself that informs an architect? I do. I mean, we don't have that anymore because, you know, once you start doing projects that are higher budgets and out of town, you can't really do design build. Sure. And I wouldn't have done design build for Coppola, but mm -hmm. uh, the, the Hollywood people, like the Sioux people and stuff. But um, the... Um, the moment that we were getting slow and I went to um, uh, the store and bought a tool belt and a nice hammer and a tape measure and a, and a knife and all that stuff and handed it to Chelsea and said, would you lead the construction of our two back house? <laughs> and um, the framer backed out right when we needed them. And I said, let's just build it ourselves. Let's do it. And we went down there, me and Franz and Chelsea um, and one uh, intern and we did all the framing on that house. Wow. And uh, it's funny because I had a glue lamp at the top, but it was on stud walls, but I, I wanted the glue lamp to just for various reasons. And, but they come with a camber. So we had to cut the top flat. <laughs> <laughs> and so I look over and Chelsea's got a lead pointer and she's twirling her pencil while she's making that line. <laughs> and I'm like, this is cool. <laughs> <laughs> Architects framing. It's, it's so perfect. It's ridiculous. Huh. 
Yeah. Yeah, I could see that. I could see that. So was it challenging the first time you had to work with a, a contractor, someone who wasn't <laughs> part of your yeah. team? Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, we did houses in Vermont and Long yeah. Island, and, uh, you know, all those places. And um, I, I can't be a contractor for that. Yeah. Mm hmm I want to ask you about the subject of, of uh, I guess, style or or similarities between projects, which you mentioned, um, <clears throat> because it's, it is true that some architects have their shtick, let's say, and they repeat yeah. it, and they would maybe claim that they don't, but or maybe they do, I don't know. And um, But you seem to feel the opposite way, and what's kind of interesting is that from a architecture fan's perspective, like one of the things your office is really know, well known for is rammed earth specifically. Um, I don't yeah. know why that's that is so strongly associated with you. I don't know if you're like you were the first one to do it or, or whatnot, but that's the thing that like all architecture fans know is Rick Joy, rammed earth. Those two are like almost anonymous. Um, I don't really know what my question is, but like, is is that a weird thing for you? It's a little weird, but uh, because we haven't done it in. 15 years. I haven't done a project in Arizona in, in longer than that, I think. Mm. Um, and, you know, we did Rammed Earth, and, and no, I wasn't the first one to do it. It's been done for uh, centuries. Mm -hmm. um, all of the Middle East, and uh, maybe I was the first one to do an exposed Rammed Earth building mm -hmm. in Tucson, but uh, that's that's the only first, really. And so um, it was kind of cool. I mean, it, it, it helped me get a name for myself because nobody had ever seen anything like that before when they saw the convent studios come out. Mm -hmm. It's like, what is that? <laughs> and, um, and I just thought it was kind of a natural thing to do. And, um, uh, but, you know, I don't have a signature style for lots of reasons. I believe in the building culture of place and the culture of place and finding place through nature and it's funny because people will go to the want to the uh, princeton train station and call me up did you do that <laughs> it doesn't look anything like any of our other work but there's a sensibility in the way we detailed that that sort of ignites a thought that maybe that's a rick joy project mm -hmm. do you mm -hmm. do you think your architecture would have been different if you let's say had stayed in maine rather than move to tucson <laughs> Well, I'd be uh, I'd be working at the mill, <laughs> <laughs> you know, one or two, you know, modern buildings get built in Maine a year or mm -hmm. a, a, a decade. Yeah. And so I did have a dream to go back right after school and do houses for lobstermen and stuff like that. <laughs> Once going to Will's house and uh, office and seeing the um, the way he approached things and how he could get really great clients and have so much fun is it just it became a uh, not an addiction, but it just a, something that I wanted to do badly. Yeah. Yeah. But, you know, I, I, I had a really strong moment this summer. I uh, was in a symposium, uh, with, uh, neuroscientists and we started in for a week in Santiago, Santiago de Compostela, and then went to Porto for the second week. Mm -hmm. And it was with the Yanni Palazma and, and, uh, a, a lot of great friends, uh, like him. And, you know, we all gave lectures and all that stuff. And uh, at the end of my first lecture, uh, Yohani said, you know, obviously I'm a firm believer in Alvaro Alto's work, but when he travels and he does a project in California or at Harvard um, or other places, it's a finished building. But you seem to have, Rick, the ability to uh, make the building be part of the place. Mm-hmm. And that was the biggest compliment I've ever had to be in the same sentence with Alvar Alto and yeah. Hattie Palazma to say that I'm not bad. <laughs> Whoa. And, um, and so, yeah, I never really thought about it until he said that, but it's true. You know, the Woodstock farm is building culture, a place mm -hmm. shingles, um, and Long Island that house is all, um, clad in, uh, in white granite. Wow. Mm, interesting. Like Roosevelt Island um, granite. Oh. And it's long <laughs> strips with uh, rake joints horizontally and, and flush on the ver little vertical joints. And they're four inches to the weather, we call it. And from the street, it looks like white painted clapboards. <laughs> and then when you start getting closer, it's like, oh, man, that's granite. And it came in the same price as the clapboards. Oh, <laughs> really? Yeah. Wow. Yeah. And I... I did that detailing for a reason in that just masons could lay it up, mm -hmm. not stone 
masons. I see. They're really expensive. So it's just rectangles stacked up like block. Yeah. Yeah. And um and it's turned out to be an amazing project. I mean, if there's if you're on Long Island and there's a hurricane, just go get the number, <laughs> go stay in the house. It's not going anywhere. Um what is uh, what was like moving to Arizona and what is Arizona like in terms of its culture of architecture, I guess? Um, uh, I'm thinking more specifically, like you said, Maine, uh, maybe it's fairly conservative. Other cities, San Francisco comes to mind, very conservative when it comes to its architectural mindset. What is it like in Arizona? Well, firstly, moving to Arizona was a um, moving experience. Yeah. <laughs> it, uh, <laughs> the um the thing that happened that i didn't expect is that i got here and the flora and the fauna and the way they protect themselves in nature and the way they're beautiful at the same time and all that stuff was so stimulating that i'd learned everything i could possibly learn about all that stuff i could name all the plants i could name all the trees all the animals and and stuff and i have hiked almost every trail on the on the catalina mountains and uh, other mountains and I just got out there and learned as much as I could about it because it was so stimulating, fresh and new uh, that it influenced everything because I think my mind just expanded like, wow, I can do this. And um, and it just turned into, you know, um, well, also back in the, the 90s and the early 2000s, there was still this kind of pioneer spirit from people who wanted to come to Arizona and mm -hmm. build something really cool and new and, and for their retirement. Mm -hmm. The two back house is a classic example of that. And so, you know, you just get this pioneer spirit and you get this understanding of the, of the, you know, outrageous landscape and place and the culture is, you know, we're so close to Mexico yeah. that, um, you know, every store has a sign that says abierto and open on the same side. <laughs> Mm -hmm. Right. And, um, I don't know. I just, we just did the day of the dead parade on Sunday and I went and, with Claudia and, and it's pretty intense. And, uh, we just, the weather, it's like 60 degrees right now in Tucson. <laughs> it's finally cold. <laughs> <laughs> and so no, it's just a, it's a rich place to uh, springboard from, to mm -hmm. reach out into the world and do the projects. Is it still like that today or has it changed a lot since you got there? With developments, you mean? Yeah, no, there's a, a lot of new development in Tucson. It's, uh, the, the downtown is filled in. I don't know if you've been here before, but, but you know, uh, 10 years ago, there were a lot of empty, vacant lots. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And now all that's filled in pretty much, just one left. Oh, wow. And it, it's a little troubling in that um, I didn't get a single call to do any of those projects. Hmm. In fact, right up the street from my office, they built a small hotel when we had done Almangiri. <laughs> and, you know, we know how to do restaurants now and then. And um, they built a little hotel. And I, my friend, who was like the organizer of the construction and everything, invited me to the opening. And when I walked over from my desk, it was 90 steps. Wow, close. And, and they, they didn't even think of calling me. <laughs> and um, Is and it then, a good piece uh, of architecture? Hmm? Is it a good piece of architecture? No. Oh, okay. Well, that's Just, a bummer. <laughs> why give them your business card when they need a remodel? You know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, none of the new stuff is. It looks like it's it looks starting to look like Santa Barbara downtown. Uh, I mean, yeah. I'm sorry, no, San Diego. Okay. Yeah. 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 <laughs> yeah. And so, yeah, nobody calls me. It's uh, you know, people nowadays. And I had this long conversation with Cesar on that trip to Santiago and. And Porto, uh, he's having the same problem where people are willing to, the young folks are willing to do projects for such low fees. Mm -hmm. And, you know, those hotel and housing projects and stuff downtown, they don't pay any more than 3%. What? Whoa, really? And I've got 22 architects that have master's degrees in my office from around the world. And so we have a pretty inter international office for a long time. And so below 3% would be what, like you were saying, the younger architecture offices will, would do it for. Yes, that's it. Yeah. And, you know, I try every time when uh, eventually somebody does call and I said, wait, if you wanted to buy a used commercial building in downtown Tucson, you would pay 10% to a real estate agent yeah. who's going to spend four days on it. 
<laughs> and I'm going to have five master's degree students working on this. I mean, uh, architects um, uh, for three years. And you want me to do it for 3%? No. That's Sorry. crazy. And I'm not going to do that to, to the profession. It's wrong. Yeah. 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 Um, it's uh, the, 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 the subject of, of architects fees and how much employees make as, make as a result of that. Right. And all these things are a common topic. And that's crazy. I, mean, I didn't think it would be that low because custom houses, I mean, it depends on what kind of scale you're at, but like a luxury house, it's at least in the areas that we're familiar with, it's like 15%. Maybe yeah, a little bit no, lower if it gets away. high up. That's going away. I had a, uh, what I thought was going to be a beautiful project in Sedona and we made the proposal and he goes, man, I've never paid more than 3% to an architect. 3% right. And what? I think I have um, at least 20 examples of that. Okay, for houses. But... For houses. Though mental. Okay. Okay. And, I mean... and, a, and, and a fire station. We, we thought we'd try to be, had some fun and do like a local, uh, you know, pedestrian kind of cool thing and really bring what we've learned from all these luxury projects into it and make a really fantastic fire station. Mm -hmm. uh, they didn't hire us because we'd never done a fire station before. Mm -hmm. And um, they don't pay any more than 3%. That's that's wild. Do you? Uh, we we were talking with Peter Gluck, uh, an architect in oh, yeah. New York. I still haven't met him yet, but I I, I know his work, and um, uh, it seems to do some pretty good stuff. Yeah, he does, and he's a real interesting person. Um, but he's his, the conversation with him really focused around design build, and his uh, proposal, let's say, for the profession is design build is the way to solve the issue of not making enough money. To, to you know do architecture uh, for a yeah. project is design build something I've, you guys would ever consider doing again for for local projects yeah if we get a local project that's a house or a yeah just a house yeah um and an owner who's willing to do owner builder uh we'd do it uh, the, my team would love it yeah you know um they're hungry for it. And, uh, it, you know, now the project is so far away, it's hard, kind of hard for everybody to get to it. Mm -hmm. um, but I, I always, I have great images of people, uh, at Mandarina in Mexico, mm -hmm. uh, like the whole team on site. <laughs> and, uh, you know, but you know, I would do it in a second and it is a good way to keep making money because if you do it, it takes a year to do all the drawings and get a permit and then another year to build it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so you can, you know, if there's a lag uh, those days, I just say, hey, we're going to build that one. Yeah. Hmm. And the owners save so much money. It's, it's really great. And then we make money. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I'm not in it for the money. I mean, it to build really great stuff, but still you, you, you need a people. minimum <laughs> to survive and pay people, I imagine. <laughs> yeah. So, so, I was just uh, going to ask, so then the, but, but so how is modern architecture like received by the Arizona community? I mean, I'll, I'll, most places have their their crappy uh, structures, as you're mentioning, that, you know, look like San yeah. Diego or Santa Barbara. But um, are people more open to it in Arizona as opposed to, I don't know, other places or in Tucson as opposed to other places? I think generally, um, yes. Um, although if you look at my Catalina house, um, my client, John, who still lives in his, in his 90s now, um, he said, I don't want any of that modern stuff. Okay. And I said, okay. So the great mitigator is rammed earth, rough mm -hmm. sawn wood, um, very specific attention to the way nature plays and, and all that, not a style. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think the closest we've come to like a modern stylized, modern project is our Ventana house. Interesting. But that's, a you know, intended to be like a, a hang glider falling off the cliff and uh, it had to be that lightweight steel and all that mm -hmm. um but yeah no it's um generally it's getting a little more tight you know the communities that you know make subdivisions and all that now they all have design review and they don't want that we just lost the project but we did a beautiful design in sedona different site on, in sedona uh, against a beautiful red mesa and we picked out the whitish color of some of the layers of the limestone that's up there on the mesa. Mm. And we wanted it to look like that mm -hmm. rather than an orange building, another orange building in Sedona. And um, we got rejected and the client sold the property. Oh, wow. Rejected a, because they 
They wanted the, the norms? building was kind of a, yeah. <sighs> okay. It had to be dark, a dark color and, um, and sort of be an earth tone that matches the environment. And we found a lighter tone. It's not white. It's like a, 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 a brownish gray mm-hmm. uh, limestone. And if you look up at the top of the mesa, there are big chunks that have mass wasted off the top, and those that's the color of that. So we designed it to be like a a mass wasted chunks of of uh, the stone, mm-hmm. and they rejected us. They wanted a dark colored building, and I said, guys, it's, it's 2022, and we can't af- be building buildings that are dark anymore. We've got mm-hmm. to really yeah. understand how the, that plays on the environment. Mm-hmm and how much energy you use and all that stuff. We want to do it light and uh, we're going to do solar. We're going to do all the stuff we need to do. And um, they said, no, nope, that doesn't cut it. <laughs> so silly. <clears throat> to it's, me. <laughs> yeah, I was going to say, don't you care? Doesn't your name and you carry some weight? Well, it's <laughs> their the, losses. Yeah. You know? <laughs> wow. yeah. I, I, it's an odd thing. These design review boards um, and the people who sit on them and they kind of control as much as I do feel that it's important to build communities uh meaning that like individual architecture should add up to a greater whole um a lot of times these rule sets uh i don't know who who creates them i don't know what kind of why that they would be a person of authority like, well what, they contradict why? themselves right because mm. one way like you're pushing towards sustainability being responsive and the other way you still have those other push that are you know we want a dog building it doesn't make any sense anymore things have to evolve and some rules are more important than others you know yeah, I mean, we're all involved in evolution. Yeah. Why look back to archaic forms and and processes when we should be moving forward? You know? Yeah. Yeah. Hmm. So, what's next for you guys? Is there like any new types of projects you're working on, or anything? Yeah, we um when we finished Mandarina, I um uh, we tried to do something in Austin for a mixed use development, um, and then they got too greedy and we stepped off. Um, but um, the uh, I noticed that people are starting to get a little disappointed. You know, they read Desert Works and our new one, the, the Studio Joy Works, mm-hmm. and they see all these cool little boutique houses and everything. And they moved to Tucson from Spain and Italy and South Africa and Chile, and they they get here and I put them on a parking garage in Austin, <laughs> and they're like, "No, that's not like." <laughs> and so we went to uh, we reached out for small houses. And so we're doing a really small cabin in um, Minnesota, northern Minnesota. Oh, cool. Uh, near the boundary of waters and stuff. It's really cool. And I really, it's a small cabin on a leak in the in the trees. And um, I'm not going to do a black cabin. Good. Okay. <laughs> I'm not doing it. It's very trendy, you know. <laughs> I know. Yeah. People are using Shoshogi Bond for cabinets and stuff inside. It, that's a... That's a method that's used for fighting against wildfires against your house. It's yeah. not a, 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 um, a decoration. Mm-hmm. Yeah. And so this one's going to be emerald green tiles. Oh, very like, cool. Like shingles. <laughs> <laughs> Why not? Yeah. <laughs> it sounds and really cool. We, yeah, we're having fun with it. It's a uh, don't spread it. Well, now I just spread it around. <laughs> Because what will happen is that someone else will do it just before we finish it because we can't start construction next summer until next summer. Uh, it's already snowed on the site. Uh, and um, we're doing something in Joshua Tree. Uh, a neat cool. little, little small little house. And um, and uh, then something in Greer, Arizona, way up in the mountains. All stone. And, and all three of those, well, two of those clients are in their 30s. Oh. Oh, young. And the one in Austin's in the 30s. They're in the 30s with two little kids. And so suddenly I'm, I'm, um, I can't offer marriage counseling, but I can do parental <laughs> counseling because they, they don't know. You know, they say, oh, we want a two-car garage. And I got, wait, you have three kids. When they turn 16, you need three cars, <laughs> more cars. Yeah. And they're like, oh, I didn't think of that. So it's, it's fun to uh, have these people with little kids and uh, sometimes do joke wars with them. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm in the lead right now. I'd had one in Minnesota. I said, um, uh, what did the snow people say? You can't say snowman anymore. What did the snow people say when they went outside? 
kids are all like, what? I, I don't know. I don't know. And I was like, why does everything smell like carrots around here? <laughs> That's terrible. <laughs> it's hard to find clean jokes. For me, I know. you got to be careful these point. days. Yeah. <laughs> Most of the humor we listen to is not clean. <laughs> now the what carrots are going to be upset. To the, what did one plate say to the other plate? Dinner's on me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, That's my. Really it makes it so much more fun than just yeah. uh you know, signing papers and doing details and stuff. That's really good. <laughs> so hire so Rick Joy, you get a fantastic piece of architecture that comes with bits, clean bits here or there. Clean jokes, yeah. <laughs> yeah. No, I spent too much time as a mainer. <laughs> and in Boston, those jokes are rugged. <laughs> um, and so we're off next week. Um, suddenly we've been getting calls to do projects in the, in the Caribbean. Oh. And so uh, Bernardo... Uh, great architect in my office from Guadalajara and I are flying to the, the most southern tip of the Bahamas and uh, it's a private island with an airstrip that can land a G6 wow. okay and it's it's totally raw mm -hmm. and uh, we'll have meetings to get going on some of the projects on there marinas and stables and stuff like that wow very cool and then another one on St. Bart's tomorrow afternoon I have a, a, a conference call with them mm -hmm. And uh, the, our local architect for the uh, Turks and Caicos house uh, just went there last week to scope it all out for us, so we know what we're going to talk about tomorrow. How many different projects do you have going on at any kind of one time? It varies. I mean, we're also doing uh, two houses in East Cabo mm -hmm. right now. And every week, another call to do another hotel, luxury hotel. Wow. Really? And I just... I don't know. I mean, these things, um, I'm fighting the, the, the notion of be, being, becoming a commodity to people. Mm. Huh. You know, I had somebody ask me to, yesterday to do a project in near La Paz and, um, they want us to do it, wanted us to do a design so that they could use that design to sell the property. Wow. And I'm like, no, I see. Don't do that. We do projects so that people can enjoy them mm. not yeah. for you to make money. Yeah. And so I, I declined so many hotel projects right now. It's crazy. I think at least 15 in Mexico. And, and uh, we're up for one in the Azores, the Azores, as some people call them, uh, out by uh, uh, Portuguese islands, those ones out in the middle of, uh, of the Atlantic. Oh, nice. But then you can see them, the green little dots down there when they're <laughs> flying over. And that would be amazing. Um, it's a little health, um, you know, eight room health resort kind of thing perfect for us and so what would make uh like a project or a hotel project um specifically be appealing enough to where you would want to pursue it and want to do it versus the 15 that you've declined um if i sense greed on the first meeting i'm i'm out huh. mm -hmm. you know i just uh, I, i'm not a commodity and so we could do it and they could make a lot of money and we would be stressed out shorten our lives <laughs> <laughs> That's true. right and so um and it also depends on the operator i mean i'm on back when adrian zecco was the director I mean, the, the 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 great mind behind it it was glorious i mean he's it was beautiful now it's a company they only do beaches and and urban ones and i don't think i'm going to make the cut for those anymore mm. and one and only was too much it started out great my arm around the, the mother and two sons saying, yeah, I'll do this in Puerto Vallarta. And then two years later, it's, they have made so much money on other projects that they went public and now there's a board and I didn't like any of those people. Uh -huh. And it just turned into full on greed to the point where they didn't even install the, um, the uh, control for the lighting that we designed. Wow. So everything's last call. And if you look at the images of uh, Enrique Oliveira's restaurant, you'll see that he tied napkins on the lights. <laughs> These beautiful little LED lights that come off the columns, mm -hmm. and because it was, they were just too bright, but because the owners wouldn't let us put the let the contractor put in the light control. No, oh, ridiculous! Can't dim. Mm. And so we finally got them to put in the light controls in the bathrooms and all the suites because you know who yeah. wants to look at the in the mirror with the lights on the brightest thing <laughs> maybe for halloween that could work yeah, right. yeah. well it's coming from the side yeah. it's a good thing it wasn't coming from the bottom yeah, yeah, yeah that would be bad 
but you know, it's just a, uh, if I sense greed and I don't want to do just, you know, villas for people to make a bunch of money and yeah, we really want to have a, a family or a couple or somebody to do the houses. And then beyond that, I would love to do another project like Princeton mm -hmm. where thousands and thousands and thousands of people uh, go through there. Mm -hmm. And all the architects went through there. Michael Graves, um, um, uh, um, funeral celebration was at Princeton. And all the architects from all over the world went through that train station. <laughs> Obama's gone through the through there. And you know, that's stimulating stuff. Yeah. And then all these students who are 17 to 20, mm -hmm. one, uh, go through there to go into the city on the weekends and stuff. So it's really stimulating to think about more than like two people right. enjoying the project. Yeah. And yeah. so um you know, that's kind of where I am right now. That's great. Last uh, couple quick questions. One, you guys have an interns department. Uh, when did that start? And then, oh, what time is it? Okay, then the final question is, what's your favorite building? Uh, well, we do have interior. It's not a department. We all work on interiors, but my wife, Claudia, leads that mm -hmm. and lighting. And uh, we're doing a lot of interiors right now. And, um, and I never say favorite project. <laughs> Do you have a favorite I architect? I learned that a long time ago. No, um, because then there'll be a different client from that project I said was my favorite. Say, well, I thought mine was your favorite. <laughs> I'm not going to say it. Oh, do you have a favorite building that's not your own project? Um, well, you know, the Phoenix Central Library is dear to my heart. Mm. I mean, that was yeah. three years of, of my life. And the, it's the I think it's the most brilliant building in our country. I mean, it was 93 bucks a square foot. There's so much invention in the detailing and concept work. And, um, and, you know, being right out of school, being 33 and the project manager, Wendell at the time was, um, maybe five or six years younger than me. Wow. And, uh, and I, I took it, it was good. And, but <laughs> since I was older, I was given a lot more responsibility and I got to design some really cool stuff on that building, the bathrooms. <laughs> They, they start you out in the bathrooms and they're the best part of the building. <laughs> <laughs> That's wonderful. Well, we spent, we made the engineer spend more money on the, on the bathrooms than, uh, the, a steel truss that a vertical truss holding up the things that are cantilevered 14 feet. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so when, Will comes over to me, you know, we just spent so much money on the engineering for those things, <laughs> damn it. And, uh, and they're there still. Yeah. <laughs> That's great. Uh, Rick Joy, this was phenomenal. Thank you so much for taking the time to be on the show. I Thank appreciate you. it. This was a lot of fun. Great. Uh, glad to do it. Hi, everyone. Thanks for watching this video on YouTube. If you like what we're doing, then please support our show by hitting that subscribe button and liking and commenting on our videos. You can also find us on most of the social media, Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. We're mostly on Instagram. And you can reach out to the hotline, 213 <laughs> 213-222-6950. You can send a text message or leave a voicemail if you have any reaction to this recording, any questions you might have or guest suggestion, feel free to send it our way. Cool. Thank you for watching and see you next week. Thanks. Bye-bye.